So this project has been on your back burner for several years. What stalled it? And what was the impetus that freed the production again and finished it off? It wasn't necessarily ever stalled. Um, I understand where you're coming from. So, but the story of the production was, we, I found out about it by hearing a story on the radio after the earthquake in Port-au-Prince in 2010. So to answer sort of, for those who don't know, it's been 10 years in the making. And then <clears throat> it sort of started then when I was listening to the radio and hearing those NPR Planet Money reports on it. But it wasn't until April of 2011 when this guy, Tim Myers, who's the subject of the documentary, he lived in Colorado at the time, um, said, I'm going to build this school. June, July of 2011 is when it started. And then they actually built and fundraised at the same time. So for them, it was from 2011, actually until 2016 is when the school opened. And the, the point of this documentary was to explore how to, what would it be if we just followed a project? What could we learn about international aid, about all of these issues that we deal with in the film, if we followed a single uh, aid project from beginning to end? Part of what took so long, if that's the question, basically what took you so long, um, is from 2011 to 2016, we were just filming and partly not knowing exactly how it's gonna end. Um, and so sort of going on for the ride. And then 2016 to 20 and 21, basically, because also when you finish editing a film, you usually have four, six or 12 months more of post-production, which I'm not sure if a lot of people realize. Sound, graphics, you know, mixing, color correction, all this sort of stuff. Once you've locked the creative of the edit, there's a whole nother layer that adds on top of it. So, you know, if you break it up like that, six years to film and four years to edit, um, it's not terrible. I guess if I'm being <clears throat> a little more forthcoming with you, Pat, part of it was that the film was challenging to make. Um, we didn't want to make a straight commercial for aid work or NGOs. We also didn't really believe that we think aid is inherently wrong. So it's not an anti one of these movies. Um, you know, like Poverty Incorporated or, some of the, or, or Big Men, some of these other documentaries that are in the space. We wanted to try to make a film that sort of was in between. And as artists, we didn't feel like it made sense for us to prescribe the answers to these things, but just ask these questions. Um, but then that, then that opens up a whole new level of nuance. Like you, now you're getting into just straight nuance and nuance takes time and it's hard. Um, and the, how we sort of got through that was doing a lot of feedback screenings Sending it, sending it out to folks, other filmmakers, doing feedback screenings in person when we could still do that, sending it to uh, Haitians, Haitian Americans, people who are familiar with this work, and incorporating a lot of feedback to try to make sure it was a film that felt um, honest. What human traits or flaws, which you mentioned at times in the documentary, contribute to the state of corruption, which seems to define Haiti, and why hasn't a reformer like Mandela, Gandhi, or Dr. King emerged among the sufferers in your observation? I think I'm compelled to push back on the corruption part first. Uh, I think one of the things that we're trying to do in the documentary is challenge some of the, the, the narratives that have formed about Haiti. And I'll also say, and when we talk about it, I'll say places like Haiti. There's a sort of a disaster narrative, poverty narrative, third world economy or developing economy narrative that emerges about these, about these things. And so you see it in Haiti a lot, <clears throat> but it is true elsewhere. You have a person who's in a position of power in a rural village where there's no, the central government, their federal government, although it's not the same system, but essentially their, their US government, their federal government is non-existent. The local government is existent, but not very powerful. Um, so you have someone who's in a position of power, whether, and most of the time in a place like Haiti, where there's up to 10,000 or more than 10,000 NGOs in a nation that only has like 11 million people, that's a lot, um, funneling in a ton of money. Now this person is a, is a conduit for money. And they are in an unofficial position. And yes, they're gonna take maybe some money on the side for their troubles. You know, in America, we call that taxes, you know, it's a, it, <laughs> You know, but there's no taxes really there. And so it's just complicated. And I think part of this whole experience has been rethinking how we as Americans and we in the developing economies look at how business is done elsewhere. And so sort of I'm backdooring into answering your question. I think that's the, the flaw or the challenge or the thing that we, and I think Tim would 100% agree with this. Like Tim came in 
with a sort of this is how we do it in America and because and we we're America we clearly do it the best right I mean I'm being sarcastic right now but it's also not totally sarcastic because it's like we don't have earthquakes when earthquakes hit they don't the buildings don't crumble so right it, that's where it gets immediately complicated um, to answer sort of anything but I think um, that's the sort of thing I think it's like coming in sort of headstrong I think coming in with like we know what the answers are uh, coming in that this is the only way to do it and I would say that actually goes on both sides of the equation um, on this it's both the person who's coming in and also the person who's sort of like well this is how things are done here it's like well maybe things could be done better in Haiti like yes this corruption thing maybe what if we strengthen the government like what if there were other things that could happen okay and why hasn't there been a Mandela or a Gandhi or anything like that I mean Earlier this year, after the president Moise was assassinated, you know, Biden came out and said, we're not going to get involved in Haiti. We don't want to do that. And that was all the hubbub of the time. It's like, oh, we don't want to get involved in that. And I, I would push back on that as well, because we are already involved. We've been involved in Haiti since before it was even a country. Um, and by involved, I mean, we've been messing with it and messing it up um, because of deeply racist policies. I mean, we never even... Um, said it was a country until 50 years after it was free. It was the second country in, in the world, I think, or at least in the Western hemisphere to no longer have a colonial master, the first one being America. And we never were like, we never, you know, said you guys exist. Why? Because it was run by black people, people who used to be slaves, who overthrew their masters. Half the country was still slave. The president at the time was Thomas Jefferson, known slave owner and lover. Um, so it's just like, it's we've always been involved and we're always in there and we're always not helping essentially interesting this is patrick mcdonald for hollywoodchicago.com copyright 2022